praise and blame. And so please join me in welcoming Julia Markovitz. Thank you so much, and thanks, Kathleen, especially for all the extra effort there. Um, I'm really sorry that I haven't been to the conference itself. Uh, Baby is doing better today, so that's a big relief. Um, but thanks, thanks for coming, despite um, my not being there in person. So my plan today is to give you a really quick overview of my book project, and then spend a bit more time talking about a part of it. Uh, so first, the book project. In the book, I develop an account of praise and blameworthiness. Uh, and I explore how that account can shed light on some otherwise puzzling, puzzling features of our practice of praising and blaming. And then I argue that the account also has some implications for first order and order of ethics. So that is for the question of what makes actions right, not just what makes them praiseworthy, assuming they are right. The book's still uh, a work in progress, but I have a pretty good sense of the broad outlines of each chapter. So the first chapter of the book, do you guys have the handout? Yes. 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 In the first chapter of the book, um, I developed the thesis that actions are praise or blameworthy if, only if, to the degree that they are or aren't in the case of blameworthy actions, motivated by the reasons that make them right. I defend that claim against some possible counterexamples to it and show how it can help us make sense of a lot of our intuitions about praise and blameworthy actions. And I call that thesis coincident reasons thesis, and you'll hear a bit more about it in brief today. In the second chapter of the book, I'm considering a problem for the account that I developed in the first chapter, that it failed to adequately account for all of our intuitions about degree of praise, degrees of praise and blame like this. In particular, it fails to capture or explain our attitudes towards uh, some moral example, uh, in particular towards heroic actions. And I consider and reject some natural responses to that worry and develop an alternative response which identifies an additional dimension of praise and blame within us that's not captured by the account uh, I offered in chapter one. Uh, and this dimension is going to turn out to be a appraiser relative, and you'll hear a bit more about that today, too. In the third chapter of the book, I explore the implications of that account for the, possible, the possibility of super erogatory actions, that is, actions that supposedly go up and beyond the call of duty. The account that I am defending is skeptical about the possibility of morally good but not morally obligatory actions, so strictly speaking, super erogatory actions. But it offers an alternative way of explaining our intuitions uh, that some morally good actions, for example, some actions that involve great risk or sacrifice on the part, the part of the agent, like heroic actions do, aren't ones that we can expect and demand of others, even though they may, I argue, still be morally required. And that, I think, is a salutary result, especially because the category of the supererogatory has struck a lot of philosophers as paradoxical. So it's a little sort of avoid the paradox of the supererogatory. In the fourth chapter, I explore a further application of the view that more, of moral worth that I've defended in the first three, uh, that it helps explain our otherwise puzzling reluctance to blame some past wrongs, like sexism or slaveholding, as fully as we should blame the same wrongdoing were to happen today. I argue that that reluctance reflects not, as some philosophers will have it, the exculpatory force of moral ignorance, but instead reflects facts about our lack of standing to blame, given that we correctly judge we're unlikely to have done better in the agent's circumstances. And that chapter also explores some of the limits of the appropriateness of uh, reactive attitudes like praise and blame over great temporal and cultural distance. And the bulk of the talk I'm going to give today focuses on uh, the main argument of that fourth chapter, while sort of pulling from the first three chapters to supply the necessary theoretical ingredients for setting out that argument. In the fifth chapter of the book, I examine the implications of my account for the possibility of moral luck. Uh, that is, for the possibility that how praise or blameworthy we are may be due, to some extent at least, on factors that are beyond our control. I distinguish, as other philosophers have done, between different places that that kind of luck can creep in. I argue that while it can print in my view, be a matter of luck, that a certain level of driving an agent uh, uh, let uh, for the action. So that is, we can't be uh, luckily praiseworthy or unluckily blameworthy given our motives. We might be lucky or unlucky to find ourselves with certain motives. And that's what uh, Thomas Nagel called constitutive moral luck. We might be the beneficiaries of another kind of moral luck, too, on my view. So some agents find themselves in circumstances in which their moral strength, strengths end up standing out for the crowd, uh, which makes them moral exemplars in a way that they wouldn't be if their particular strengths were more ordinary. So I think Oscar Schindler is an example of someone who had both kinds of moral luck. Um, so I'm going to talk about this case in the book. And then the sixth final chapter of the 
Cook, I look at the implications of the account of praise and complaint that I defended for first order normative ethics for the question of what makes actions right. The first five chapters of the book explore uh, the question of what makes actions praise blameworthy while remaining neutral about the question of what makes them right. Nothing I argue up to that point in the book assumes any particular theory of right action, like utilitarianism or Kantianism or whatever. And I defend the account of praise and blame I offer on the basis of considerations that are, for the most part, independent of any first order moral commitments, or at least any that I don't take very wide, widely shared. But I argue in the final chapter of the book that the account gives us reason to prefer some first order moral views to others. And that's because certain first order moral views when combined with the account of moral praiseworthiness that I've defended, have very implausible evaluative implications. And in particular, the account defended in the first five chapters sits uncomfortably alongside any moral view that, like some versions of consequentialism, maybe classical utilitarianism, uh, tells us not to be motivated by the features of our actions that that view picks out as right making. So classical utilitarianism, at least on some uh, accounts of it will tell us not to be motivated by the things it tells us are the things making our actions right. So my argument, I think, gives us some reason to reject at least those versions of utilitarianism and some related views. Well, at least some versions of virtue ethics hold that what makes an action right is the fact that it's such that the virtuous person would perform it. There's also, it seems to me, something morally suspect about being motivated by that fact. So we shouldn't aim to become like virtuous people. We should rather aim to help others or something like that. Nonetheless, I, so I think that the, the uh, account of moral worth I offer also provides some ammunition against those versions of virtue ethics. Still, I think the virtue ethics ethicist turns out to have been right in the central claim that we can learn something about what makes actions right by first thinking about what makes actions morally valuable, uh, morally admirable. I mean, uh, after all, that's uh, sort of the project of the book. OK, so that's a very brief sketch of uh, of the book, uh, I want to now dip a little bit deeper into some aspects um, of the project, um, again, mainly focusing on bits of chapters one and two and chapter four. All right, so I'm going to start by focusing on a particular puzzle about crazy claim. But as you'll see, my interest is really broader than that puzzle. It concerns how we should understand degrees of crazy claim more this more generally. So uh, the exchange that I'm about to read uh, from President Trump's now infamous press conference in Trump Tower in the aftermath of the violent demonstrations protesting the removal of Confederate statues in Charlottesville, Virginia, will be familiar uh, to most of you, I'm guessing. So the reporter said, the neo-Nazis started this thing. They showed up in Charlottesville to protest. And Trump interrupts and says, excuse me, they didn't put themselves down as neo-Nazis. You had some very bad people in that group. But you also had some people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group, excuse me, excuse me, I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of them a very, very important statue, and then renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. And then there's a cross talk, and Trump says, George Washington was a slave owner. Was George Washington a slave owner? So will George Washington now lose his status? Are we going to take down, excuse me, are we going to take down statues of George, George Washington? Or Thomas Jefferson? What do you think of Thomas Jefferson? You like him, good. Are we going to go take down the statue? Because he was a major slave owner. Are we going to take down the statue? Now, there are lots of ways that we might respond to Trump's worry there. So for one thing, as other commentators have pointed out, there might be an important difference between lionizing historical figures who are slave owners for achievements, like writing the Declaration of Independence or leading the Continental Armies in the Re Revolutionary War, or creating a model for the presidency or something like that, that were uh, by and large unconnected to their slave holding. Or lionizing or memorializing such figures for their role on the wrong side of the fight that was largely about the perpetuation of slavery. But it seems to me that the interesting question survives that defense of Washington and Jefferson. Washington and Jefferson were slaveholders. Slaveholding is, it hardly needs to be said, a great moral wrong. But is their participation in that wrong sufficient reason not to celebrate them? Would it be sufficient reason not to celebrate Lee, even if his achievements were less intimately tied up with the wrong of slavery? And how, by comparison, should we feel about the protesters romanticizing the Confederacy and fighting the removal of these statues and the renaming of the park? They aren't exactly advocating slavery. And whatever else we can say about them, they aren't themselves guilty of the even greater wrong that Washington, Jefferson, and Lee are guilty of. They aren't themselves slaveholders. And still, my attitudes for Washington and Jefferson, and maybe even Robert E. Lee, are more positive than our, our attitudes towards the protesters. And they are so, it seems to me, and perspectively at least, 
not just in virtue of those men's separable, uh, separable positive contributions to history, which, to be honest, I know a lot less about than I should. So here's the phenomenon I'm hoping to get a better understanding of. Our practice of blaming is to spend at least time relative. We don't blame the slave holders as much for their wrongdoing in an era where its moral status, uh, uh, where slave holding was generally seen as morally acceptable, as we do in an era where its moral status was uh, controversial, like in uh, Lee's era, and in our own era, where the wrongness of slavery is recognized to be as close to a moral truism as we're likely to find, we may blame contemporary apologists, mere apologists, one might say, even more than we do the acts of slaveholders of the past. And a similar phenomenon arises uh, for a practice of praising. So condemning slavery gets you, of course, no special praise today. Condemning slavery in the days of the Revolutionary War, when abolitionism, at least in the New World, was in its infancy, might merit great moral admiration. So how should we understand what's going on in those cases? <laughs> Rosen offers an analysis that could help. So Rosen has argued that just as non-moral ignorance can exculpate, so too can moral ignorance. And he labels that the parody thesis. I think it's, I'm hoping, yes, it's on the handout on the top of page two. In many cases, you know, the fact that we're ignorant of some relevant non-moral facts absolves us of blame for the actions we perform in the That's true, he says, not just when we couldn't have known those facts, but also when we could have known them, but our ignorance is somehow non-culpable because it's not the result of negligence or recklessness or deliberate misconduct in the management of our opinions. So say I put salt in your tea, thinking that it's sugar. Let's say it's in a bag marked sugar. I could easily have discovered that it's salt just by tasting it first. But it's not negligent or reckless to trust that a white crystalline substance found in my kitchen in a bag labeled sugar is in fact sugar. So I'm not blameworthy for my ignorance or for salting your tea. I could have known better, but it's not the case that I should have known better. Rosen argues that the same line of thinking exculpates many wrong acts that are performed not out of non-moral ignorance, but out of moral ignorance. In the moral case, just as in the non-moral case, he thinks it would be intuitively unfair to blame someone for doing something if um, he blamelessly believes there's no compelling moral reason not to do it. And Rosen argues that there can be cases of blameless moral ignorance. Ancient Hittite slaveholders, he thinks, can't be blamed for failing to recognize the wrongness of slavery. Similarly, the sexism, sexism fathers in the 50s who encouraged their sons but not their daughters to go to college is non culpable. He assumes that moral ignorance in each case is not for non moral ignorance. And those people are blameless for their ignorance, according to Rosen. He says that they fail to see through a pervasive and well-protected ideology need not be a sign of culpable recklessness or negligence on their part. It might just be a sign of ordinariness. And if that's right, we should conclude that their ignorance is not their fault. So in short, if it would have taken an extraordinary person to recognize the moral truth, failure to recognize it can't be culpable Rosen thinks, even if the truth was in some sense accessible. It's not fair, he argues, to blame someone for doing something who blamelessly believes there's no compelling moral reason not to do it. The example suggests, and in fact, Rosen suspects, that blameless moral ignorance of that sort will be widespread and may justify a much more general skepticism about holding people responsible for wrong actions. Whatever we think about the culpability of uh, the moral ignorance exhibited by the Hittite slaveholder or the 50s dad, it does seem intuitively like their wrong actions like the slaveholding of Washington and Jefferson, are less blameworthy than similar, than similar behavior would be today. Rosen's parody thesis and his account of non culpable ignorance seem to explain those intuitions and to gain some further support for them directly. The analogy to moral ignorance on which Rosen relies strikes me as troubling. And that's because non culpable, non moral ignorance does more than just exculpate, it doesn't just relieve us of blame, it also changes, I think, what we're obligated to do. Not only am I not to blame for salting your tea, if you ask for sugar and I, despite my ignorance, refuse you the crystalline substance in my kitchen, then I think I've acted wrongly. It's a small wrong, but it's a wrong. Or imagine a doctor who refuses me the penicillin she justifiably believes that I need. She fails in her obligations to me, even if, unbeknownst to both of us, it turns out I'm allergic to penicillin, so she's done me a favor. But surely we don't want to reach that conclusion in Rosen's cases of moral ignorance. Surely it's not the case that the Hittite slaveholder was right, not just blameless, to support slavery. 
but that the 50s dad was obligated to give preference to his son's college ambitions. And surely they should feel guilt and remorse if they were to learn of the error of their ways. I shouldn't feel guilt uh, or remorse for putting this all to your team. Regret, maybe, but not guilt. I worry that Rose's account entails not just a plausible relativism claim, but also more thoroughgoing and, and to me at least decidedly less plausible moral relativism. Rosen's argument that the moral ignorance of ancient slaveholders in 1950s Texas is not culpable worryingly entails that ancient slaveholding and 1950s sexism weren't wrong and the subjective sense of wrong that's relevant, I think, to establishing our obligations. And what's more, it seems like the early slaveholder, the 60s dad, the 50s dad, uh, who come to see the light should then feel guilt and remorse for their wrongdoings, but Rosen's account can't explain that. It's not, as I said, appropriate to feel guilt and remorse in the supposed parallel non-moral case. I might feel guilt for putting salt in your tea, but I, but, uh, I, I shouldn't feel guilt. And if I did feel guilt, you should tell me not to feel guilt. <laughs> right, so we have two worries, I think. There's the worry that Rosen's account appears to entail that agents who on his view act blamelessly also don't act wrongly. And there's the worry that those agents uh, then turns out can't appropriately feel guilt or remorse for what they've done. And I'm going to add a third worry to that. As I noted at the outset, the phenomenon I'm interested in explaining, the apparent time relativism of blame, has a counterpart in the case of praise. It's unclear how we can explain that half of the puzzle by appeal to non culpable ignorance. Maybe the idea is that abolitionism in the 18th century was supererogatory rather than required above and beyond the call of moral duty, but that suggestion holds little appeal for me, I have to say. So we might respond to those worries about Rosen's view in a couple of ways. First, we can accept the parity thesis, but insist that moral ignorance is very rarely non-culpable in a relevant sense. So a better version of the parity, uh, parity thesis might say that epistemically justified moral uh, epistemic, sorry, epistemically justified ignorance or false belief of any sort of exculpates moral or non-moral. It's not clear to me that the false beliefs that are had by the Hittite Lord or 50s dad are epistemically justified, even if it would be in some sense inappropriate for us to claim them uh, because of how ordinary those false beliefs are. I'll have more to say that, about that in a minute. There are, I think, good reasons for thinking that testimonial evidence in these sorts of cases provides less justification for moral beliefs than for non-moral beliefs. One good reason, which Sam McGrath has pointed out, in the case of recognizing moral experts to rely on, much more than in the case of recognizing non-moral experts, it may take one to know one. So the testimony of the morally benighted to the similarly benighted may be a poor source of justification. And that move allows us to maintain that ancient slavery and 50 sexism were wrong, but doesn't on its own explain our tempered blame of such behavior relative to similar behavior today. So may, um, not culpable moral ignorance, very rare, uh, helps avoid the problem I posed for Rosen, but it also means that his account can't solve uh, the puzzle uh, that he was trying to solve. Second, we can reject the parody thesis and insist that non culpable moral ignorance doesn't exculpate after all. The view that non culpable ignorance exculpates might gain some support from a sort of control principle of the sort that Nagel depended in his paper on moral luck. I can be blamed for outcomes only if they are, in a relevant sense, in my control, or if my lack of control uh, is my fault. And control of the outcome of my actions may require conscious awareness of how what I'm doing will affect the world. Non-moral ignorance undermines that sort of control. Am I, did I cut out? No, you're here. Can you hear us? Oh, OK. I think I'm back. Okay. All right, sorry, I'm not totally sure um, where I cut out, but um, all right, so control of my outcome, uh, the outcome of my actions may require conscious awareness of how what I'm doing will affect the world. Non-moral ignorance undermines that sort of control, but it's not clear that moral ignorance undermines that sort of control. It doesn't prevent me from knowing what I'm doing under the relevant description. So uh, my non-moral ignorance uh, prevented me from knowing that what I was doing was putting salt in your tea, um, but my moral, so the 50s dance, Moral ignorance doesn't prevent him from knowing that he's shutting down his daughter's college ambitions and so on, um, even if it prevented him from knowing the moral status of what he was doing. That second response points to a class of views about praise and blameworthiness that's at odds with Rosen's, as he himself allows. Those are the 
so-called quality of will views. According to those views, whether we're praiseworthy or blameworthy it depends on whether we're good or ill-willed, whether or not we care in the right way about what matters morally. Non-culpable, non-moral ignorance exculpates because it shows that an action that might at first look like an expression of ill-will, putting salt in your tea, was in fact nothing of the sort. But the same can't be said for moral ignorance, whether it's culpable or not. The slaveholder's moral ignorance does not disguise or dilute the lack of proper moral concern that he feels in the slaves. Quality of will accounts have a lot going for them, uh, but they don't seem to help us explain or explain away the imperative, the, the apparent intuitive time relativism of praise and blameworthiness. So I'm going to spend a little time describing uh, one quality will style account that I find attractive, namely the one that I defend in the book, and then explain why I think that account needs to be supplemented if it's going to help us understand our initial puzzle. So according to that account, praiseworthiness is very roughly a matter of being motivated to perform an action by the normative reasons that make it the right thing to do. And blameworthiness is very roughly a matter of failing to be motivated by such reasons. So my book defends a view like that. Uh, no, Mayor Polly has defended a view like that in the past. Uh, so a bit more precisely, the book, uh, the first chapter of the book, I defend uh, what I call the coincident recess thesis. That says that an action is morally praiseworthy if and only if, to the degree that, uh, the non-instrumental reasons motivating the action coincide with the non-instrumental reasons that morally justify its performance. And uh, I want to add to that uh, the course of recent thesis for blameworthiness, which says that an action is more blameworthy if and only if and to the degree that the non-instrumental reasons motivating the action fail to coincide with the non-instrumental reasons that morally justifies performance. Now, of course, that requires some unpacking. So the normative reasons that morally justify actions are facts. They're considerations that count in favor of performing the action. So for example, the fact that jumping in the water will allow me to save a child's life is a normative reason that morally justifies my jumping in. But the fact uh, that jumping in will allow me to save life can morally justify my jumping in only if, the, if it's a fact to which I have some epistemic access. If there's no way for me to know that the child needs my help, then it's not the case that I morally ought to jump into the water. So the normative reason uh, that morally justify action, the moral obligation surrounding reasons, are subjective. We're morally required to do only what we have sufficient epistemic reason to believe it would be best to do, not what it would, in fact, be best to do. That's why, as I said before when discussing Rose's cases, doctors are morally obligated to prescribe the course of treatment their evidence tells them is most likely to cure their patients, not the treatment that, against all evidence, happens to be best. So if the evidence suggests that I need penicillin and my doctor doesn't have any evidence that I'm allergic, she fails to fulfill her obligations to me if she refuses me penicillin, even if it should turn out that I was allergic. Cases like that illustrate that the reasons morally justify our actions, and uh, indeed uh, which actions are justified, depend on our evidence. Because the reasons relevant to moral options are subjective, because they depend on what an agent ought to believe about her situation, our normative reasons for acting can't be given by facts, like my unpredictable allergy, of which we're blamelessly ignorant. That, remember, was why Rose's parody thesis seemed problematically to entail that his non culpably uh, morally ignorant slaveholders don't actually act wrongly in the realm of that's of wrongness. An agent's motivating reason, designed for term, is also a fact. It's one that supplies a certain kind of explanation of the agent's action. Motivating reasons are the kinds of facts that we're after when we ask about an agent what were her reasons for acting as she did. Those that appear in what have sometimes been called rationalizing explanations. The other kinds of facts can also, of course, explain our actions, such as biochemical facts about our brains, or facts about how much sleep we've been getting, or how much coffee we've had to drink. And those might also be called reasons, but they can't be described as our reasons for acting. So the, reasons I, the reason I snap at you might be that I haven't gotten enough sleep lately, but that can't be my reason for snapping at you. It can't be my motivating reason. My motivating reason will always be some fact on the basis of which I chose to, chose to snap. If people were always perfectly self-aware and sincere, then their account of what prompted them to choose the acts they did would always provide us with their motivating reasons. But I don't assume that people always recognize their own motivating reason. The coincident reasons thesis appeals to an agent's non-instrumental justifying and motivating reasons. Adding that qualifier, non-instrumental, is I think very important to making the coincident reasons thesis plausible because the thesis owes us an account of the length which are motivating and justifying after overlap for actions to be morally praiseworthy. 
In the interest of saving some time now, I won't talk about why I think it's the coincidence of non-instrumental reasons that's important for moral but we're happy to talk more about that uh, in discussion. All right, so now what does it look like when an atheist motivating and justifying reasons coincide? So, whoa, okay. <laughs> One thing becomes immediately clear, all right. Um, I have to, so I have five minutes left. And we, we started a little late, but yes. Okay, um, I'm worried I'm not gonna get to the, some of the main things I wanted to uh, get your feedback on, but okay, so uh, press on. All right, so. Um, and we will have a little more time for questions also, so if you wanna take some of the question times to keep talking. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, thank you, sorry. Um, all right, so. We're often motivated by several contributing reasons, and our actions are often justified by a combination of reasons. So we might do the right thing for some of the right reasons, or right-making right, right -making reasons might be only a part of the explanation of our acting why we should. So overlap between motivating and justifying reasons can be a matter of degree. And correspondingly, praiseworthiness and blameworthiness for our actions can also be a matter of degree. We act praiseworthily to the extent that we're motivated by right-making reasons. And even wrong actions can have something that counts in favor of them because some of our reasons for acting wrongly may also be genuine reasons counting in favor of those acts. And I think that's an intuitively interesting feature of the thesis. And I think uh, the thesis has a lot to be said for it. Um, it helps us capture a lot of our intuitions about particular cases, which I'm not gonna talk about uh, right now in, in the interest of saving time. Um, I can talk more about it again in the Q&A. So I was pretty happy with it, but it has this weird implication, which is an implication of great relevance to the puzzle that I started out with, um, at least if we take it to provide the whole story about times and degrees of moral worth, um, which I no longer take it to provide. Thinking about that implication and about uh, my puzzle uh, makes me think that the thesis doesn't tell the whole story. It fails to capture some significant aspects of moral admirableness. So here's the weird implication. The thesis entails that any completely morally worthy action, any action that's entirely motivated by all the right-making reasons is just as worthy as any other. Um, in other words, it entails that the predicate morally worthy is like the predicate full. Any completely full glass is just as full as any other completely full glass, regardless of the volume of glass. But intuitively, it feels like some completely morally worthy actions are worthier even than other completely morally worthy actions. So we saw that intuition at work in our puzzle cases. So abolitionism seems more praiseworthy in 1780 than in 1860, and more praiseworthy in 1860 than today. Uh, despite the fact that it is in the terms established by the Fuzzy Reasons thesis, but both is worthy in each case. And heroic actions also come to mind. Some have, we might say, a greater volume of moral worth. So what, uh, how do we understand that greater volume? So here's a natural thought. We admire heroes in part, at least, because we think we would not have had it in us to act as they did had we been faced with the same decision. So let's consider that hypothesis um, uh, in a bit more precise way. Here's the thought. An action is more praiseworthy relative to Appraiser, the rarer it is for members of the appraiser's moral community to have the moral strength that would have led them to perform the same action had they been in the agent's place. An action is more blameworthy relative to an appraiser. The rarer it is for members of the appraiser's moral community to have lacked the moral strength that would have kept them performing the action had they been in the agent's place. We can see how that account works by focusing for a moment on the case of heroic actions. A heroic action, according to the account, is a right action of some moral significance that most of us judging the action wouldn't have had the moral strength to perform had we been in the hero's place. So here are some interesting consequences of that way of understanding heroism. First, it makes what counts as heroic action or as a hero a relative matter, relative, I think, to the moral qualities of the speaker's community. Because what counts as an extremely unusual case of moral fortitude will depend on what counts as normal. And that introduces a source of ambiguity into our descriptions of heroism that I think is reflected in our linguistic practice uh, because it's not always easy to identify the relevant comparison class against which to determine whether an action counts as heroic. And different speakers will disagree about what should be uh, the relevant comparison class. So a striking example of that, which reinforces on my view of my kind of heroism, is the frequency with which people held up as heroes demure and resist that label. So, um, Consider the soldier, who once sets a member of our moral community, who risks his life to disarm a bomb or pull a wounded comrade out of the crossfire. Such acts will strike those of us sitting on the sidelines as heroic, but we, we couldn't imagine performing them ourselves, but they might well strike the soldier as normal because any one of his comrades would have done the same, and we might both be right. 
So here are some real life examples. Um, Cory Booker, uh, when he was mayor of New York, Newark, once rushed into a, uh, a, burning, a neighbor's burning apartment and uh, pulled her out, and he was called a hero for it. He said, uh, that's way over the top, honestly. There are firefighters that do this every single day. I'm just a neighbor that did what most neighbors would do, which is to jump into action to help a friend. Um, so he's uh, appealing to something like uh, the story I tell here. Firefighters wouldn't necessarily agree, though, with Booker, but he says that they're the true heroes. So here's a quote from a firefighter who was ser seriously injured after he uh, managed to rouse all the police residents in the case of a, a gas leak help them evacuate, evacuate. He said, I feel like I'm not a hero. I just did what everyone else would have done in that time. It was our job. We're to go in and protect the citizens, and that's what we were doing, making sure everyone is safe. And here's a case I find particularly interesting. It's the case of Stacey Lewis, who's the parent of a child uh, named May who was born with a severe, with severe brain damage, and she's writing the New York Times' motherhood blog here. And she writes, people are under the mistaken belief that as the parent of a disabled child, I deserve admiration. Some, amazingly, even tell me that I'm a better person than they are. So am I more, more devoted, more loving, more ambitious than other parents? The reality is I'm no different than you, dear reader. I'm no different, and that must be very frightening. I did not do anything to deserve a disabled baby. I did not do anything to be rewarded with her. I had a normal pregnancy. I took excellent care of myself. It happened to me. The truth is it could happen to you. This week alone, two doubtlessly kind people commented on my blog. They claimed I was their hero. I didn't do anything to achieve this, certainly nothing heroic, unless unknown to me, attending May's physiotherapy appointment has now been elevated to heroic importance. Mm -hmm. Not only do I not want to be anyone's hero, the fact is I'm not any kind of hero. I'm plainly not. I'm not the parent of a disabled child out of choice. The phrase, I could never do what you do, surfaces frequently. I didn't have a choice. When the impulse to run away was strong, and it certainly was, society, my upbringing, Jewish guilt, the pressure I placed on my life ensured that I chose May. The fact that some people in my situation abandon their children does not make me a hero. It makes them jerks. <laughs> <laughs> right. Lewis rejected the little hero because she behaves towards her daughter just as she believes most others in her position would have done. But she also very clearly resents the label hero with its suggestion that caring for her daughter is somehow, in contrast to other parents caring for other children, more than should be expected of her. So I suggest that the heroic actions and right actions that most of us belong to the speaker's community would not have performed for the aging circumstances, and that the difficulty of defining the speaker's community provides a source of ambiguity in our descriptions of heroism. And there's another related source of ambiguity, uh, uh, deriving from the difficulty of defining the circumstances. What are we to hold fixed when we try to imagine ourselves in the aging's shoes? So think again of the soldier or the firefighter. It's natural in evaluating their acts and to imagine ourselves with our own actual histories and resulting dispositions, trying to do what the soldier does when faced with this choice. But actions that look heroic in that light might look less heroic if we imagine ourselves not just faced with the agent's choice, but armed with his training or his experience. And that may not be an, an easy imaginative feat, so that difficulty is again reflected in the kind of demurals that are common with descriptions of heroism. Uh, Let me interject right now. We have eight more minutes in the block um, before okay. we're supposed to be done, so you can keep going as long as you want to take questions whenever you want. Okay, all right, all right, thanks. So uh, I, I want to talk about one, I think I, I, there are two other things I want to talk about. I'm just, just skipping it. So one is a, 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 an interesting puzzle case that arises when we think about, uh, about the first responder cases, I think, which are actually very interesting to me. So, um, so one thing that, uh, that we have to ask ourselves, or to ask ourselves, is the first responder acting heroically? Is whether we sh whether we should build in the fact that they received special training for this uh, work uh, when we imagine when we ask ourselves would we have acted that way too? I think I've lost you. Yeah, we lost you. Just a second. We can hear you now. Okay, you're back. Okay, hear me. Okay, all right. Um, and another thing I think we have to build in is um, the fact that they've taken on a special, uh, voluntarily taken on a special obligation. So soldiers, firefighters, other first responders present an interesting case to think about because they, they uh, offer a puzzling example of what might at first look like a class of actions that are heroic to perform, but blameworthy to fail to perform. So one sort of recent tragic example of that was the case of Scott Peterson, who was the school resource officer at the Parkland school shooting who was 
gotten a lot of criticism for not uh, rushing in to confront the shooter. And in a very moving article about this situation that was published recently in the Washington Post, he says, uh, he complains himself terribly about this. He says, I've cut the day up a thousand times, a million different what-if scenarios, but bottom line is I was there to protect and I lost 17. And a sympathetic neighbor says, come on, it's not all on you. And he says, but that's the perception. You're a hero or a coward and that's it. And that seems very puzzling. Um, how could it be possible that there's no middle ground between heroism and cowardice? So one thing I want to say about that kind of case is that it strikes me that there is a middle ground. Um, because what we're asking about in that case is not was the action of rushing in heroic, but rather, um, or, or failing to rush in blameworthy, but rather is it blameworthy to take on that responsibility and, and fail to rush, rush in. So we might think it's, it's heroic to take on that responsibility and then either rush in or be willing to rush in should the occasion arise. Uh, and it's blameworthy to take on that responsibility and not rush in. And, and the middle ground is most of us who don't even, who don't take on the responsibility in the first place. So that's one interesting case I want to think more about. Um, the other thing I just quickly want to mention, um, uh, you know what, I think I, I'm going to stop there, and uh, apologies for not getting to the end of my uh, planned comments, but I'd rather, I'd rather hear your questions and talk about it, talk about them. Okay. Well, thank you. Are there any questions? Anne. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is really awesome. Uh, I was wondering if you're, if you could give an account of the ethics of blame and ethics of praise that reduces to your account of reasons, which I really like. Um, and that that could explain the relativism. So what if uh, the evidence that I have concerning, you know, this first responder going in or the mayor going in and saving somebody um, changes what reason I have to attribute praise or blame to them? Um, and if I were in, let's say that I am a first responder myself, maybe my evidence is different about how you know, heroic that is, or how difficult it is, or something like that. Um, and so it makes sense that I might not pray and heap praise on my fellow first responder if I'm just a civilian, given my evidence. I might not, uh, I might be okay with, you know, praising them, heaping praise on them. Um, so I, I didn't hear that perfectly, but I think I, yeah, I think I understand what you're asking. So, so. So can you say, just repeat it one more time, sorry, yeah. just the, the, the core question. The core of the question is whether you have an account of the ethics of praise and blame that can do all of the work that your like, coincident reason species do based on your account of reasons. Um, and it can give you the relativism of appropriateness of blaming and praising in the cases that you So I think the coincident reasons thesis, I think some aspects of praise and blame worthiness are non-relative and some are relative. Um, and I think the coincident recent thesis captures the non-relative part. Um, I think, it, I mean, it's, there's, it's still going to turn out to be relative to some facts. So, for example, to the extent that we think that um, ignorance is non-culpable, um, it may capture um, you know, the extent to which uh, people are praiseworthy or blameworthy relative to what they know. So there's an element of relativism there. Um, but I, I don't want to treat the cases that Rosen is interested in or uh, the case that comes up in the, in, the, in the Trump press conference that way because I think um, that relativism also will trickle through to what the relevant agent's obligations are, and I think that just gets the answer wrong about those cases. Uh, I think rather that these cases should be explained by appeal to some a fact about our standing to blame. So that's sort of where uh, the account of heroism I was just giving is going. That, um, whether we have standing to praise or blame, um, thinking especially about the blame case now, depends also on what we would be willing to do ourselves. And I think that's, that's partly for reasons having to do with the ethics of blame. So one reason for it, I think, is that uh, uh, blaming, uh, resenting, um, is different from, say, just feeling annoyance or anger at someone in that it claims a moral high ground. If I blame you, then I'm also claiming a moral high ground. So I'm making a claim as to my own moral standing relative to you. Um, that, that means that I shouldn't blame you for things that I think I would have done myself. And I think that explains some of our intuitions about the sexist dad and the early slave holding cases. Um, secondly, I think one thing we're doing when we blame people, and this is drawing on some work by Ian Rosen and Tom Sc uh, Tim Scanlon, um, is uh, we're deciding whether or not they are in the relevant sense one of us. And uh, what counts as one of us, again, reflects some facts about our own moral standards. Um, so what, there, there are actions we don't want to blame too much, 
because we see ourselves as we identify with the agents in a way um, that would be threatened by our blaming them. Um, I think that partly explains the tolerance that some vegetarians have of non-vegetarians, um, even, even vegetarians who think that meat eating is really a very grave moral wrong. Uh, hi, Julia. Thanks for that. Um, so I'm wondering, the, the people who say that they're not heroes, so they're wrong, I guess, is the right thing to say there? Um, they have a mistaken uh, apprehension of what their community is like? Is that is that right? So we want to say that they're just... Sorry, sorry. You cut out and cut out in the middle. Can you just repeat that first yeah. part again? Yeah, so... People? I, right, so... People who do something that we consider heroic, and then they say, I'm not a hero, anyone would have done the same thing. We want to say, on your account, they're wrong. They've made a mistake, right? And then I'm wondering about whether um, being mistaken in that way, having this mistaken belief about uh, the, what members of the community are likely to do, in fact, like, enables or informs terrorism. So I'm wondering about the, the kind of role of a potential misunderstanding here in, in motivating so uh, this is the same part of your question oh, that I sorry, back. Sorry. I think, I, so I think you're asking so I think it's certainly a, a, a feature of my view that we will often uh, make mistakes in uh, praising and blaming because we make false judgments about um, what most people would do in certain, certain circumstances so like in the Milgram experiments I think most of us think before we read all, you know, the results that we would not have done what the, the participants in the Milgram experiments did. Um, and yet the experiments suggest most of us would have done exactly what they did. So that's a case where um, we may lack sanity to blame, but we don't realize it, and so we blame anyway. Um, so, yeah, so I think that we'll often make mistakes with blame, and I think it's a reason to be cautious about blaming. Um, one thing I think that is a, a cru crucial to me, a, a crucial reason to prefer an account like the one I offer over one like the one that Rosa develops is that uh, I think one thing you learn from this account is that praise and blame, are, uh, that sort of guilt and remorse and shame are not just the first personal versions of blame and resentment. Um, because you don't need the moral high ground in order to feel guilty. In fact, it's sort of conceptually confused to think that you would. Um, you're <laughs> occupying the low ground. That's why you feel guilty. Um, so I think one thing I want is an account that does explain why these agents should feel guilt and remorse, even if um, it's not we don't have standing to blame them. Um, so uh, and I think that's something the account I, I prefer offers that Rosen's account does not. Okay, we actually might have time for another question or two. Christine's given permission. <laughs> so, so there are any other? Uh, this is Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Just piggyback on that last question, if you can hear me. Uh, so on the hand, as is heroic actions or right actions that most members of the appraisers feel they would not have had the strength of will to perform had they been in the, in the agent's circumstances. So uh, su suppose I judge that the soldier in World War II jumping on a grenade, I judge that person to be heroic, did it for heroic action. Mm -hmm. uh, suppose I think that members of my community uh, today would not have done such a thing. Suppose I'm wrong about that. Suppose they would have done such a thing? Oh, shoot. <laughs> Just a second. OK, we've got you. Should I, yep. should I start over? Or, hey, I'm uh, sorry, that cut out. You're supposed to throw yourself on the committee. Yeah, so you, so you judge that this uh, soldier's action in World War II was heroic. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yes, right, OK. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, he throws himself on the green. Yeah, and, yeah. and you think it, you, that members of your own community today wouldn't have done that if they were in the circumstances. Okay? Um, and yet, yeah. unbeknownst to you, they in fact would have. Um, yeah. And then you learn that about your members of your community. Uh, that doesn't put any pressure on me to retract my judgment of heroism. Um, learning that about the members so you, of, my, of so my community. Uh, still makes me inclined to think that that soldier in World War II was doing something heroic. I, I don't feel any, any pressure. So you think even if you discovered that everyone would have done the same? Yeah. In my community today, you... yeah, I, I'm still inclined to think that what that soldier did in World War II was heroic. So maybe can you convince me or okay. tell so, me where, so where have I got over the screen? Is that, 
be judged as heroic because it, not every man would have done it, even though no one would have done it, or? Sorry, I know. Yeah. So is this, so here's a way of taking the, the worry. Um, is that similar to what you were saying? Here's, here's one way. So if, if the thought is it's still heroic because it was rare for um, for his time for him to do that, even though today it would not have been rare, we've discovered, is that the thought? Yeah, it could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that case, so that makes it like the like like the abolitionism case. So yeah, I take yeah. it to be homework in a sense. Um, the, you know, the people involved in the abolitionist movement, partly what they were doing was more more dangerous to them than than, than, than opposition to slavery today. But I, I take it to be somehow especially morally admirable to see the wrongness of slavery in the early days of the abolitionist movement. Uh, what but is not admirable at all today. And sure, and surely everyone should know that that much. Um, and so I think, I guess what I would say is, when we ask, would everyone do it today? We're not just asking, we have, there's a question about what it is. <laughs> would they throw themselves on the grenade if they were in the agent's shoes? And where aspects of the agent's um, you know, time and cultural setting are relevant to that thought experiment. Um, so if that's what's driving the intuition for you in the soldier case, that you know, in those circumstances, he did something unusual, which today wouldn't be unusual. Um, then I think, well, that's something that would probably build into the thought experiment. Okay. If the thought's just that, no, it turns out this thing that's probably very unusual turns out to be really common, um, then I think I would revise my, my judgment that it was heroic. Um, I think we can learn, just like I revised my judgment, uh, that's not to say that there aren't still lots of, of good things we can say about it. <laughs> um, uh, I think there are lots of difficult, costly things that we do all the time. Uh, Parenting, I think, gives us some good examples of them um, that aren't heroic at all. Um, what Stacey Lewis did was full of costs for her, but I think she's right that it's, it wasn't her right to do them. Thank you. Great. One more. Can I? One more? Okay, excellent. Last question. This, this is a poorly informed psychologist question. Um, but uh, one thing that's striking to me is that I, I don't think, what, what if you, you would never be able to know the counterfactual. I mean, people aren't very good at knowing what they do in counterfactual situations. They're not good at estimating the behavior of their peers, all of that. And so to what degree does your account require a fair amount of accuracy with respect to that? Is it a problem if we could never know the answer to what we or our community would have done in World War II, for example? Yeah, so I think so. I think you're absolutely right that often we're very bad at making these judgments. So the counterfactuals, there, there are different reasons why we might have a hard time um, running them, <laughs> running these thought experiments. Uh, some of them are hard to run just because, yeah, because we're very bad at, at knowing these things. We're bad at, I mean, even you know about ourselves in situations that are much less distant from us than a lot of the ones I'm asking us to run these counterfactuals about. Uh, and that, I think, like I said before, is a reason to be very cautious, to, to use blame cautiously. I think often we blame people in situations where, you know, we don't really have the standing to blame because we don't know that we would have done any better. We really don't know. It's not just that we know we wouldn't have done better. We really don't know. And I think, I think the Milgram experiment is a cautionary tale in that regard. Um, in some cases, it's hard to run these thought experiments because they almost don't make sense. Um, so change so much about ourselves to put ourselves in the shoes of the agent that we're evaluating that there's none of us left. <laughs> and I think those are the cases that really hit up against the kind of conceptual limit of, limits of the appropriateness of blame. I think Bernard Williams you know, argued that, that across certain distances, these kinds of reactive attitudes are just inappropriate. And I think, to, to me, um, the question of when it no longer makes sense to uh, perform the thought experiment, that marks that limit. So, um, I think one reason it seems weird to blame the ancient Hittite lords of Rosen's example is that they're so different from us. There's no, it doesn't make sense to ask what would we have done in their shoes. Uh, we, we, would, we would get lost at that point. Um, there's no we left um, to ask that question about. And so I think that that you sort of hit up against the limits of appropriate blame, not because the person who doesn't merit our blame, but because blame is just out of place at that point. Okay, all right, well thank you very much.